Today on Know the Truth from Philip DeCourcy. Everything you do, you do in hope. You date in the hope someday to get married. You diet in the hope of losing weight and being healthier. You don't break the law and speed in the hope that that's good for your insurance and your premiums. You're willing to pay the price of service for Jesus Christ at a cost because you know that God's no man's debtor. Welcome to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. I'm Wayne Shepherd. In challenging times, we tend to focus on what we lack rather than what we have. But Paul's letter to the Ephesians reminds us that if we are in Christ, we are spiritually rich. Today on Know the Truth, Philip urges us to have full appreciation for all the spiritual blessings God has given us. It's the start of a brand new message from the Life Together series, and you can access the entire study online at ktt.org. Here's Pastor Philip. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 1. We're in a series on Ephesians, if you're joining with us this morning. We trust you'll keep coming back and join us on our journey through this wonderful book. We looked at verses 1 and 2, and then we looked at verses 3 to 14. And this morning, we're going to look at verses 15 to verse 23, a message I've called Full Appreciation. You see, in verses 3 to 14, Paul has outlined for them all that they are and all that they have in Jesus Christ. He has helped them understand the sweep of God's saving purpose in Christ toward them. The Father chose them. The Father has adopted them. The Son redeemed them and has shown them that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, they're going to be part of a glory story that never finishes. The Spirit then indwells the believer and seals them and guarantees that someday they will find their feet in heaven itself. The Father administers salvation, the Son accomplishes salvation, and the Spirit applies salvation. And Paul now in these verses is praying that they would come to comprehend that ever so deeply. And so let's listen to God's Word Why don't we stand in honor of God's Word, take your copy of God's Word and open it to Ephesians 1, verse 15, and I'm reading from the New King James, translation of inerrant, holy, sufficient, eternal, authoritative Word of God. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet, and give him to be head over all things in the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So reads God's word, and you may be seated. If you visited Hearst Castle in beautiful California, you know something of the story of William Randolph Hearst. He was a newspaper magnate, businessman, politician, very wealthy, very well healed. And the story's told that one particular day he was reading an art magazine or an art catalog, and he saw some art valuables that he wanted to add to his art collection. 
And so he tasked one of his team to go and find these pieces of art and pay whatever price necessary to add them to his collection. And after several weeks, this particular man came back and told him that he had located the collectibles and that he had found them in one of William Randolph Hearst's own warehouse. He already had it. He already owned those pieces. Can you imagine? Here was a man who failed to appreciate all that he already had. Here was a man who hadn't yet possessed all that he possessed. William Randolph Hearst already owned what his heart desired. And in fact, what he wanted and what he desired was unjustified and unwarranted since he owned the very things he desired. And like Hearst, many Christians feel to appreciate all that they are and all that they have in union with Jesus Christ. They fail to comprehend this magnificent passage in Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. They fail to appreciate, they fail to give thanks to God on a regular basis. They fail to be bowled over by the thought that God the Father has blessed them with every conceivable blessing in the Lord Jesus Christ. They have a blind spot, even as a Christian. Just the high wealthy they are, they have a blind spot, even as a Christian, in recognizing their exalted spiritual status in union with the Lord Jesus Christ. And sadly, their thinking is impoverished. Sadly, their confidence in God becomes bankrupt. Sadly, their prayers are poor and lacking in confidence and boldness. Their sense of self is diminished, and their hope for the future is threadbare. That should not be so. Because when you and I understand all that we are and all that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope should be expansive, our prayers should be bold, our living by faith should be marked by courage and confidence. You realize this morning that your spiritual bank balance is fabulous. Paul, in this letter, talks about the riches of God's grace, and he talks about the riches of God's glory, and how that in union with Jesus Christ, you and I enjoy incomparable riches. We have the Father choosing and adopting us. We have the Son redeeming us. We have the Spirit of God guaranteeing our future. We are fabulously rich, richer than William Randolph Hearst, richer than Elon Musk, richer than Bill Gates. You and I are fabulously rich. I like the story that is told of a husband who said to his wife one day, you know, one day we will be rich and we'll be able to buy a lot of things. To which she replied, from a faith perspective, we're already rich. Maybe someday we'll have money and we'll be able to buy a lot of things. Oh, my friend, you and I are rich this morning. We're rich in the things that matter because we're rich in the things that death cannot steal and money cannot buy. We're fabulously wealthy. We have joy unspeakable, don't we? We have peace that passes all understanding. And not only is our joy unspeakable, it's full of the thought of a glorious future which brings about the joy. And yet the problem with so many of us is we don't realize our status and our wealth. Too many Christians today are on an endless quest for more, and they're failing to appreciate that they are already complete in Christ. God can't give you anything more because he's given you Christ, who is all in all and you are complete in Christ. Now, you can come into a greater understanding of that, and that's what these verses are all about. They had all that they needed, and Paul prays that they would understand all that they have so that they would stop feeling needy. 
I've used this quote before. I'm going to use it again here. It's a perfect quote. It's in his book, Believe in Miracles But Trust in Jesus. And Adrian Rogers said this, sometimes people ask me, Adrian, have you received the second blessing? And I say, yes. And then they want me to explain and tell them all about it. And he says, well, the second blessing is discovering what I got in the first blessing. And he says, not only have I experienced a second blessing, I have experienced a third blessing, which is discovering that I haven't learned all that I got in the second blessing. That's where Paul's at. That's the heartbeat that's driving him to put down his pen and pray. So let's come and look at these wonderful, wonderful verses. As Paul prays that they might fully appreciate all that they have and are in Jesus Christ. Paul longs that they might know the hope that's found in Christ, grasp the riches that are ours by grace, and live by the power that is ours in the Holy Spirit who indwells. Let's put this text in its context just quickly. It's one long sentence in the Greek New Testament, 169 words. Paul was with them for three years, and he writes this about five years later. The word therefore, maybe you've got a translation that puts it for this reason, verse 15. And Paul's kind of going, okay, I finished talking about the Holy Spirit who makes the Father's choice and the Son's redemption real in your life. He applies the saving benefits of Christ's work to you he says, that which the Holy Spirit makes real, I pray will become more real. Paul gives thanks for them, but he prays for a full appreciation of what they have in the Lord Jesus Christ. The report of their faith in God and their love for the saints ignites this prayer. By the way, I love that symmetry. Don't you love that description? You know, for this reason, After I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for the saints, I didn't cease to give thanks, and I began to pray that God would indeed help you appreciate all that you have in Christ. I love that symmetry, faith in God, love for the saints. Don't miss that, verse 15. Faith in God or faith in the Lord Jesus and love for the saints. It's two axes of relationships. There's the vertical relationship between you and God or you and the Lord Jesus Christ with faith being the connection. And then there's the horizontal relationship between you and the believing community. And the one affects the other. If you're in a vertical relationship with God, it will define and show up and manifest itself in the horizontal If you've truly put your faith in Jesus Christ, you'll know it and you'll show it by loving the saints. You can't come to know the love of God and not be a loving person. That's the whole argument of 1 John chapter 4, isn't it? I think my friend Mark Hitchcock told me that he heard Stanley Toussaint, a wonderful old theologian at Dallas Theological Seminary, now with the Lord. He heard him say this, quote, You can measure a man's love for God by how he treats others. It's a good statement. I've heard about your faith in Jesus Christ and your love for the saints. I've heard how that vertical relationship is intersected with that horizontal relationship and defined it. So there's three things I want us to see from the text. I think there's three things in the text. Paul said, hey, what I've heard about your relationship with Christ has brought me to renewed thanks for the work of the gospel in emphasis. And I want you to know I'm praying for you. And here's what I'm praying. I'm praying that you would have a greater knowledge of God's person. Verse 17, right there at the end, the knowledge of him. I'm praying that you'd have a greater knowledge of God's plan that with an enlightened heart, verse 18, you might know the hope that's been produced by your calling. And then verse 19, and I'm praying that you would come to know the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. So let's jump right in. This is Paul's prayer for them, and this is a prayer that we should pray for each and every one of us. Let's pray for a greater knowledge of God's person. That's verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. 
See, Paul himself has a passion for a knowledge of the holy. You get that in his autobiographical statement in Philippians 3, where he tells us, hey, I want you to know, I count everything but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. I'm giving up anything and everything that gets in the way of knowing him, being closer to him, being more intimate with him. In fact, he tells us his own prayer in verse 10 of that same chapter, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. And I want to enter into fellowship, a sharing with him in suffering. And you've got this heart on display here for them. What Paul desires for himself, he desires for them. He desires that the God of the Lord Jesus, the God who has revealed himself in Christ, the God to whom belongs glory, that they might know that God ever so more and ever so intimately. You notice that the New King James has translated the word spirit in the lower case, and I think that's proper. There's a debate. If you've got an NIV, it's in the upper case. Is he asking God to give them the Holy Spirit of wisdom and revelation? I think it's no. He's asking God to give them a spirit, a mindset, a disposition, an orientation of the heart marked by insight and an unveiling of the character and glory and person and works of God that they might know him and continue to know him. He prays that the God of our Lord Jesus, who has revealed and unveiled himself in Christ, would open them up to what the incarnation of Christ has opened up. In fact, it's interesting, this word revelation is apocalypsis. It's the word used in the book of Revelation. It means the unveiling of Christ. And in many ways, I think one commentator puts it this, here's what he's praying for. He's praying for uh, apocalyptic moments, eureka experiences, that as they look into God's Word through the spectacles of the Holy Spirit and come to see the glory of the gospel through Jesus Christ and the love of God and the grace of our Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit, that they would have eureka experiences of God that it would dawn on them just how much God loves them and what it cost him and the glory of that whole thought. Might come driving your car. Might happen in the shower. Might happen just by the side of your bed, on your knees with an open Bible. But he's praying that your eyes would be open and your heart would be open to that reality. Now quickly, there's three things about knowing God. The priority, the picture, and the process or the path. This is a priority. Now, you won't find the word priority or first in our text, but since this is the first thing he mentions about what he's mentioning to God for them, we see it's a priority. His priority, the first thing he prays for them is that they would know him, that they would know him. It's top of the list. If you go to another of Paul's prayers in Philippians 1 verse 9, or you go to Colossians 1 verses 9 and 10, you'll get that same thought. He says in his prayer for the Colossians, for this reason, we also since the day we heard do not cease to pray for you and to ask, listen, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. This is a passion of Paul's and it's a priority. Let me ask a question this morning. Listen, is there anything? Can you think of anything? Can you come up with anything that rivals the glorious possibility of you knowing the Creator? Nothing can rival with that because everything else is but an expression of His creative power. But you and I can know the Creator of all living things. That's a priority, and that's a possibility. God has made Himself known so that you might know him. He's the God of the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus made the Father known, declared him. There's no greater priority in your life this day than to get to know God more. I've got another question. Is there anything crueler than to live life within the creation in ignorance of him? Would you do that to yourself? Would you have this self-inflicted wound where you would hurt yourself by going through life without knowing that God has made himself known because he wants you to know him? He wants you to walk and talk with him along life's 
narrow way. Is there anything more glorious than knowing him? Is there anything crueler than not knowing him? Listen to these words by J.I. Packer, famous for his book, Knowing God. Here's what he says. We are cruel to ourselves. You know, metaphorically, you might as well shoot yourself in both feet. We are cruel to ourselves if we try to live in this world without knowing about the God whose world it is, who runs it. The world becomes a strange and mad and painful place, and life in it is a disappointing and unpleasant business for those who do not know about God. That's true, and that's why it's a priority that you come to know Him. Listen to the words of Jeremiah. This is a good admonition. As you think about your life and your dreams and your aspirations, and I filter all of that through these verses. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, and let not the mighty man glory in his power. Let not the rich man glory in his wealth, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. That's the first thing you would want others to know about you. As they get to know you, you want to know about me. You want to know what makes me get up in the morning, what makes me tick, that drives me forward. I know the God who made himself known in Jesus Christ. And that's the path I'm on. That's the adventure I'm taking. And I want to know him more and more and more. That's the priority of knowing God. What a tragedy not to know him. It doesn't matter what you know, and it doesn't matter who you know, if he doesn't know you, and you don't know him. You're listening to Philip DeCourcy here on Know the Truth, the start of a message called Full Appreciation. You can hear this broadcast again and share it with a friend when you visit us online at ktt.org. And Philip will be back with us in a moment, so stay with us. At Know the Truth, we're committed to delivering these daily Bible teaching messages because we believe knowing God's truth changes everything. God's truth changes how we raise our families, how we serve at work and church, and how we relate to our friends and neighbors. And today, Philip wants to encourage you with a book that addresses one of the issues in our society today, The War on Men. There's a popular belief that masculine men, assertive, risk-taking, single-minded, are a toxic problem to be solved. And this misguided notion threatens our whole society. The cultural elites cheering the decline of men are trying to erase God's design for half the human race, the half that historically provides, protects, and leads for the good of others. The disappearance of the masculine ideal is bad news for men, and it's terrible news for women. In this book, author Owen Strawn cuts through the ideological fog, explains what's at stake, and offers hope in God's Word. A copy of The War on Men is yours when you give a gift of any amount to know the truth. Give online at ktt.org or call 888-644-8811. Now, with more to share, here again is Pastor Philip. Hi, Philip DeCourcy back again. I want to take a brief moment to tell you how you can stay connected with Know the Truth. You can visit us online at ktt.org, and there you'll find individual instructive and inspiring resources, which challenges believers to embrace God's unchanging Word in a changing world and live each day for His glory. You'll also find links to our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages so that you can stay up to date on all things Know the Truth and easily share the gospel message with others. You can also download the KTT app or podcast for easy listening on the go. Just search the app store or podcast for Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. All right. Thank you, Philip. And you can learn more at ktt.org. I'm Wayne Shepherd. Come back tomorrow when Philip continues this message. That's Wednesday on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.